as we were reverberating the lyrics on the song in terms of who he is and who we are. I couldn't help think about our discussions this morning. I was privileged to, um, to teach in Roland's absence the Sunday school lesson this morning and our focus was Genesis 28. In Genesis 28, to, to bring you up to speed is Jacob on the run from his brother Esau and Isaac and Rebekah who have been a part of the plot, Rebecca, and what she did was done to Isaac. But now they're concerned about losing two sons. Because if Esau catches up with Jacob's, Esau's going to kill Jacob. And we know that would be a concern because, you know, two generations back, I'm sure they'd heard the story of their brother their uncle Cain killing his brother. So they send Jacob on to be with Laban. And while Jacob is en route, Jacob uses a rock as they did customarily as a pillow, and while he's asleep, the Lord gives him a dream, and we know it to be as Jacob's ladder. You see, folks, angels going to and for from heaven to earth. And what we see in that is that the Lord is making clear to Jacob that he's going to be part of what the Lord is going to do. He's going to reconnect heaven and earth what Adam did that severed the relationship between God and man, Jesus is going to put back together. So the Lord shows him that he's going to be a part of that. And I said that to you to say this. I'm sure Jacob was stunned to see that a holy God was still committed and was going to use him, though he had been a part of the scheme to deceive. Some of us are sitting here and sometimes we wonder, can God use someone like me who've done so much? And the answer is yes. What we saw is God's commitment to his creation. Because Genesis 1 and 26 tells us that they said, let us create man in our image, in our likeness. And I love what he says in Malachi. He says, I, the Lord, do not change. I don't change. And the reason why he doesn't change, there are no emergencies in heaven. There are only plans. We're part of that. You are part of that. Last week I made reference to we have to move the gospel from being this big blanket of covering everything, though it does. Everyone come unto me, all who come, but we have to get it to where it's personal. We have to get it to the point where he's my God. He's my father. Okay, he loves me. And before I can bring my relationship with him here, I need to have it here. Amen. Because once I get it here, then he's going to open doors for me 
to exhibit what has gone on in me and what he's willing to do through me. Amen? Yeah. So, last week we introduced verses 21 through 28 in Mark, and we covered the fact that Jesus is there in the midst of the people, and I read you the story, and I did so that the story would, would become more intimate to you, that you could see the elements, because when you read it, that Jesus was there, he was preaching, and this man got up who had a demon, and he cast the demon out. But there's so much more, because it was a place just like this. It was people just like us. And you say, well, Pastor Ken, that was way back. How could it be people like us? Well, let me present this to you. How many times do you think that man had attended the service? You think it was his first time? Mm -mm. So what does that say to us? That says that we can come in and out of these doors and we can have a pew or a seat with our name on it and still not be where God would have us to be. Hello? Because the man was there in the midst of the service and he was possessed with a demon. Somebody had to see that, right? Hello? I mean, if nothing else, the man should have got uncomfortable. Because when you begin to speak about the Lord under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the devil can't stay. He can't handle it. So what does that say about the service? Hmm. What did that say about the rabbis? Ooh. Yeah. Now, let's think for a moment about demon possession. I told you last week, if the Spirit of God lives inside of you, demon can't come in and live in you. Because God ain't going to share that space. Because he's a jealous God. Amen? However, I also said <laughs> that we could be influenced. Yes, we can. Particular, particularly if we are a carnal Christian. And a carnal Christian is the one where the Lord ain't in control. We're kind of just going through the motions. We're religious. We have religiosity. I spoke with you about the pastor who spoke about, you know, casual Christians and committed Christians than sanctified Christians. And I have you to know, Miss Jan, she surely said to me Wednesday, you know, Pastor, when you talked about those current Christians, you were looking at me. <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> it was pretty close though, wasn't it? It was pretty close, wasn't it? Oh, 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 okay, okay. She said, when you were talking about about a demon possessing the person you were looking at me kind of funny. <laughs> we have to be mindful though. We have to be mindful of who we are and whose we are. We have to be mindful of what we allow to come into our eye gate and our ear gate and that of our hearts. We have to be mindful. We don't deal with, 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 with demon possessions this much in the 21st century as much as they did it then, but we need to understand because we don't do it or deal with it does not mean it's not happening because it is. The things that we're seeing, 
the mass killings that we're seeing? The things that God hates that we're seeing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we must not discard it because in the 21st century, we don't deal a lot with demon possession. Yeah, we need to. But I don't wanna, I don't wanna go there. I wanna bring it to another level. Are the possessions that you have possessing you? Because also often the things we get, we begin to behold them, and then they get in the way of us beholding him. And in a country where we have so many toys, and we have so many toys because we've been blessed so, and often we will put the creation in front of the creator. Well, what does that represent? That represents that our possessions are now possessing us. What about some of the things, the opinions people hold about you? Things people have said to you when you were young. When they told you you weren't going to do this or you weren't going to do that or you couldn't be this or you couldn't be that because you were this or you were that or your family was this or that. Do those things still linger and hinder you? See, I was speaking about Jacob because, look, you know, Jacob, Jacob was surprised. Jacob said, oh, my goodness, the Lord of my father, he's committed to me. He said he's going to be with me. Jacob was surprised that the stuff that he did wouldn't separate him from the Lord, from the Lord's perspective. And we too have to understand that element of God's compassion and not let these carnal things, I call them carnal appendages. Because the carnal appendage, what it does, it attach itself to you, just like a leech, and it begins to draw from you. And that's what the world does. If we're influenced with all of this that's going on in the world, I told you the story how one day I left the house mad as a bunch of hornets because I just watched one of the TV shows, one of the news shows. And I asked the Lord, Lord, why am I so angry with all of this stuff, with these things these people are doing? He says, you should be focused on me, Ken. You should be focused on me. Because those shows make money when they get someone like me agitated because I'm passionate about truth and about righteousness, and I act as if truth and righteousness is coming from them. But it isn't. I discovered that they have made a decision that the matter, look here. The matter they make me, the more money I'm going to send them. Hello? They want to keep you angry. And is the anger of God? He gave it to us, but it's to be righteous anger. So I made a decision to turn from those things in the world. And I filled myself up with the word of God. doesn't matter what the opinion of people have of me because I'm God's child and no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. They're going to form, but they won't prosper. 
Well, how is all of that? Well, that comes through the power and the authority of Jesus. The authority of Jesus. Al, give me those, give me number three, I think it is. Slide number three there. One more, one more. Nope. No, okay. That's okay, you don't have, no. No, that's last week's. That's okay. Look, Jesus says, hold on a minute. Jesus says to us that at the cross, he achieved the authority that the Father had promised for us. We now have power living inside of us. Okay, we no longer need any man to intercede on our behalf, though it is healthy, okay, to do so, it is. However, we have free access to the Lord himself. Amen? Amen? So, I want to, as I always want to do, I want to read to you the scripture that so make that clear. 1 John 5 and 19. Here's what it says. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil, the evil one, the enemy. The whole world is. But Satan didn't know all what Jesus was going to do. So here's what he speaks to us in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world undergo the same kind of suffering. So what we undergo, the challenges we undergo, the temptations that we face, is nothing new. But we're dealing with one who have been dealing with us from the very beginning. Okay? And he knows us. So if I'm out on my own trying to do things on my own, guess what, guys? I get in trouble. And what the enemy loves to do, the enemy loves to move us to isolation. He began to lie to us about folks that's praying for us, may it be family, may it be the church, and we go off onto our own. That's exactly where it is he wants you to be. As I said last week, he will deal with you on this corner with the intent of running you to the other corner, and the other corner is where he has the trap set for you. That's how he does things. So I want to read you something. Jesus demonstrated the power of love as he speaks with full authority to fight against evil. The Lord's words have power to touch, transform, heal, and set free for those who believe in him. He is solely the truth that gives light and meaning to life and death, to our struggles. He's the one. He's promised us. As you seek me, you'll find me. Come unto me, all of those who are burdened and heavy laden. He understands the battles that we have ongoing in our lives. And boy, look here. They are forever. As long as we're here. But we have to be reminded that there's no surprise to God. There's no surprise to our Father. Just like it said in the video, he is perfect in all of his ways. He invites us, he beckons to us to come. Come to me. I have what it is you need. I am your protector. I am your provider. I'm the one who will comfort you. He specializes in it. Colossians 2 and 15. Look what he says. 
And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I love that. Thank you, Al. You're there. At the cross, I remember what the cross represented. Suffering. Suffering. Separation. Death to enable us to receive life. What he went through enables us now to be able to call upon the Lord. You remember what happened to the veil? It was rent, not from the bottom up, from the top down. So that it's clear no man did it. But now we don't need someone to go before us the way they did when they had the sacrifices in the feast. A priest would go into the Holy of Holies, only him. Now we have access to God on our own. We can talk with him and walk with him. We can say to him, Lord, I'm tired of waiting. What's taking you so long? Why haven't you done this? But you know what I love? It doesn't move him. One of the things I've learned, and that's why I wanted to end with that video, he's a good, good father. Because with my children, after a period of time, and with your children, and after a period of time, and them whining and crying, you give in and say, give it to him. Get out of here. Take it and go. God won't do that. He won't give you something you're not ready for, regardless of how much you cry. Amen? Amen. You still with me here? Yes. Next one, Al. I wanted you to read this. The authority of Jesus. Authority is attributed to God the Father. The power you have. I think I told you about the dream that I heard about. In one of the books I wrote about a man who had a dream and he was lying on the sofa. And boy, every time the devil would come after him, he would call upon the Lord. He'd be sleeping and the devil would wake him up and he'd call upon the Lord and then Jesus would run the devil away. On this particular night, he called out to Jesus and Jesus didn't show up. And he had to fight the devil on his own. And then he asked Jesus, where were you? Jesus says, I was there. But I wanted you to know that you have inside of you what you need to defeat the enemy. Amen. You know what he was saying to him? Grow up. Hello? Amen. Grow up. You can do this. Authority is attributed to God the Father. It is, look, it's resident in his very, in his very nature. In his nature. Authority alludes to deity. Look at deity's right to command and enforce obedience. Do you know why Jesus was so powerful here on earth? Because he was obedient. Oh, yeah, yeah. He had the spirit of God without measure. And yep, he was the son of God. But now remember, he stepped out of being God. Give me the next one, Al. I think this one right here. Look at this. Read these scriptures. Jesus says, I do nothing on my own. Imagine that. You've heard me ask the question. Imagine God praying to God. Because that's exactly what Jesus was doing. He was all God. He was all man. But he was praying to the Lord and asking the Lord for instructions. Look what he says. I, do, I can do nothing. I judge, look out, I judge only what I hear. Obedience. Jesus' obedience was, out, look here, it was without question. What's our hindrance? Disobedience. <laughs> Next one here. Look at this. 
who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. I'll let you all read the rest. Now, what we have to understand is, look here, he did all of that for who? Huh? Yeah. Look, I want to read you something. Can I read you something? Christ incarnate authority through obedience to the Father. The authority of Jesus doing his earthly sojourn, it is important to understand something of the nature of Christ in the flesh existence. Though he maintained his full divine nature as the son of God, for the love of others, us, point at us, us, for the love of us, come on, point at yourself, for the love of us, make it personal, for the love of us, he made a decision to not to grasp or to hold to his status or the equal being equal to God with the Father. Instead, he emptied himself and he stepped out of eternity into time. And he did it just for us. You've heard me say the creator became his creation to save his creation. Can I get an amen? amen? Did you get that? And I've told you, I, I haven't read that in the book, and it won't be until I write it. But if I keep preaching it, somebody's going to go with it, I'm sure. But that's the revelation that he gave me. The creator became his creation to save his creation. Can I did all, look here, I did all of that for you. I did it for you, Ken. And I've told you, when I stand to say I'm my favorite, look here, I'm my father's favorite child, God smiles when I say that. Because I'm not the only one. He wants you. He wants you. He wants you to know that. Then he wants you to declare it. Yeah. He wants you to declare it. Jesus got rid of the demon. I read you the story last week, and the ending of the story was this, that Jesus, when he got rid of the demon, the man was now his old self. And the people that knew him embraced him. He was now back to being part of the community. What community? The community of God. And that's what God is still doing. See, we're the church. And when the church loses its way and begin to look to the world, to look at to regulate the things that only God can, it upsets him. The world is going to do what the world does. But it's my responsibility to hold the mantle, which is the torch of righteousness. I get up in the morning and say, Lord, place upon me the armor of God. Upon my head, the helmet of salvation. Why? So my thoughts will be of you. I will think of you all the time. This is why Isaiah said in Isaiah 26 and 3, those whose minds are stayed upon the Lord are kept in perfect peace. And Jesus brought it to the New Testament when he says, I came that you would have peace. My peace I give to you, not as the world does, but a peace that transcends understanding. Yeah. Shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Lord, don't let it be that I run to places that are not of you. No. If they're not embracing you, I don't need to be there. Can I get an amen? amen? Then it able me, to, look here, to lift the shield of faith 
that I can call those things that be not as though they are. I'm praying for someone who isn't saved, but I don't give up because they don't come right away. Because if I give up on them, I got to be reminded the Lord didn't give up on me because I didn't come right away. How about you? No, I didn't always hearken to God the way he called me to hearken to him. And enable me to lift the, look here, to put on the breastplate of righteousness, which is to believe. To believe God. And always remember that belief is followed with actions. If you say you believe, then I should see that in your behavior. But don't tell me it's green and you're walking on red. Don't tell me it's high and you're stooping low. Be who you say you are. And then the last part of that, Omer, is the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. Yeah. I love it. Jesus had power over living creatures. You remember the donkey and the coat? And the coat had never been written. The coat had never been written. And you don't get on a donkey's coat if the coat have not been broken. Scripture tells us that they threw the blanket on it and Jesus got right on it. Which means he had power over creatures. You know what else he had power over? Sickness. Do you know how many times he healed folks with leprosy? How many times the deaf couldn't hear, the blind couldn't see? Yeah, he had power over that. How many people did he raise? And there are some people who would say, if I was back in those days, I would believe more when he was raising people from the dead. But I would say to them, are you saved? And if they say to me, yes, I can tell them, go to the mirror because you just went from death to life. Can I get an amen? amen. We're looking for something that we already have if you're saved. The problem being, we have to ask ourselves a sincere question. Am I who I think I am? I love what Job said. Job said, I know my redeemer lives because he lives within my soul. I have the evidence. The Lord didn't leave us alone, alone to figure it out. He said, I'm going to let you go figure it out. No, that is not what he did. And I have asked you, I don't know if any of you have done it since I said it to you, but I said it to you for the third week in a row, and that is, ask the Lord, Lord, are you pleased with me? Are you pleased with my life? Please, Lord, don't have me fooling myself. Don't have me thinking something that I'm not. Because, you know, if you come in here on Sunday, you're going to hear the truth. I'm going to lay it out for you. Some people will look at some people will get up and run out of here. They just sit back and go, I ain't going to listen to that man and all this stuff. That's OK. But I'm going to keep preaching. it. Yes, I am. Because I know what set you free. What set you free is the agents of change. The agents of change is the word of God and the spirit of God. And they work in conjunction with one another. It's not one or the other, it's both. And that's exactly what Jesus said to them. That's what Jesus told the disciples. <laughs> Jesus told the disciples, when the helper come, he's gonna, look here, he's gonna speak to you. Yes, he is. And as I've said to you, your life, please note, there are no emergencies in heaven. There are only plans. And your life is a part of it, if you're a believer. 
So we could have spent a lot of time speaking about demons and the walking dead and all of these movies out about casting out demons and boy, we can do all that. And you know what? All of that would not have been at you, in my opinion, nothing at all. But to say beware of your possessions that they're not possessing you, beware of the things people say to you that they're not possessing you, beware of the world around you that it's not possessing you, and if there's any possession going to be on, you know, if there's any possession in my life, it is this, what Paul says. Know ye not that your body is the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells within you and you are not your own. You were purchased with a price. Amen. My body is God's temple. This is where God lives. And the Spirit of God lives inside of me. Oh, yeah, I'm possessed by him. Oh, yeah, I surrender to him. But it's the only thing I know of in this world that you can surrender and gain power. Amen. You can surrender and gain authority. And I've, say, I've said to you, say this to you again, and I hope you begin to use it. That the Spirit of God didn't come just to be a resident. He came to be the president. Amen. Can I get an Amen. amen. I don't think I said anything to you today that's out of the normal. <laughs> I got to be nice to her because she bakes the best desserts in the world. <laughs> Guys, as we consider the New Testament and the evidence that reflects the fact that Jesus exercised authority over all heavenly beings. And Jesus has said to us that he's given to us authority. Remember that young man on the sofa having a battle with the enemy? And because he didn't see Jesus, he didn't think Jesus was there. But Jesus reminded him, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I was there with you, but I want you to take your rightful place. And the reason why he wanted him to take his rightful place because Jesus died for it. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come today and we're reminded, Father, of we read the scriptures, all what you, what you've done and what you're doing and what you will do. I pray today that those under the sound of my voice will be mindful, Father God, of their own possessions. They'll be mindful, Father God, that we belong to you. That when we gave our lives to you and you came to live inside of us, you declared then that we were your property. And we know that you are a jealous God, rightfully so because you paid for our redemption through your son, Jesus. Now, you might be here today, and you've heard something that have moved inside of you, that caused some movement in you, and you need to come and pray. Well, we'd love it. The altar's open. Miss Heather going to play lightly. Miss Jane's going to play lightly. And if that's you, and you want to come up to the, to the altar and pray, Please do so. You know, maybe you are here and, and maybe you've been looking for a place, a place where you can come and be a part of the family of God, a place that you can give of yourself to help others. We'd love to have you here. In either of those situations, or maybe you just want to come and pray, I remind you to keep praying for, for Roland, keep praying for Larry, Freitag, and Sarah. But also, if you need to come and pray today, please, in either of those situations, come. Come.
Father God in heaven, we thank you. We pray that you will continue to guide us and that, Lord, we will continue to submit ourselves to you. To seek after you. To seek you first. To know beyond a shadow of a doubt, Father God, that if our eyes close here in time, you've called us home that we will wake up into your glorious and wonderful presence. Lord, we think in terms of Peggy and how vibrant she was on Wednesday night in the Bible study and how she answered questions and she spoke to us and if she was in such a celebratory mood. We had no idea that the next day you would call her home. And that's what it is with all of us. We don't know. Scripture says that we're to be ready. There's no doubt that Peggy was ready. So I pray for all under the sound of my voice today that each of us will know that we're ready if you called us home. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We give to you glory and honor. In Jesus' glorious and wonderful name we pray. And all said together, Amen. Amen.